Good day, everybody. I am Dr. Flor Marie Emmanuel R. Pilapil Amante, or Doc Maying for short. I am an assistant professor of the Department of Veterinary Clinical Sciences, College of Veterinary Medicine, University of the Philippines, Los Baños. And I am here to give you a lecture on ethnoveterinary medicine, a viable alternative for livestock and poultry therapy. This is the outline for our lecture today. First, I will be discussing on the identification, collection, and preparation of medicinal plants. Second, I will be giving 30 examples of medicinal plants. I understand that we have tens of thousands of medicinal plants here in the Philippines, and I will only be discussing a few together with a few herbal medicine or herbal plants that can be located abroad. The third will be on the processing of medicinal plants, together with showing you the end products of these different processes. And lastly will be the various ways on applying these end products or herbal medicines to our animals, especially our livestock and poultry. Ethnoveterinary medicine is being practiced worldwide and even in the developed countries where they use Western medicine, some are also practicing ethno-veterinary medicine. In fact, we have these three publications available online. You can purchase them via eBay or Amazon. We have the first entitled as the Alternative Animal Healthcare in British Columbia, which caters to not only farm animals, but a few small animals. The second one would be the middle part, the veterinary herbal medicine. And the third one would be on ethno-veterinary botanical medicine, which uh, encompasses both for the farm animals and for small animals as well. More popularly, ethno-veterinary medicine is being practiced here in Asia. And we have the leading country who had been uh, practicing this for several centuries now. We have China, and they specifically have a term for their practice, TCM or traditional Chinese medicine. We have one publication here entitled CIS, Chinese Veterinary Herbology. Okay, come next would be on the other part of Asia. We have India and the neighboring countries who also heavily practices ethno-veterinary medicine, and they call their practice as Ayurvedic medicine. We have our publications here, ethno-veterinary medicine in India, and an ethno-veterinary medicine, an annotated bibliography of community animal health care. And not but not the least, we have Africa also heavily practicing ethno-veterinary medicine because they do not have good access to the commercial medicines and they are very, very rich with natural resources. So we have one publication here entitled Traditional Ethno-Veterinary Medicine in Asia, which you can easily access online free and uh, easily downloadable. And you can see in this uh, book uh, that they have uh, several of the diseases already with their established ethno-veterinary protocol. Unfortunately, several of the diseases that they have there listed are exotic here in the Philippines, so we cannot really use it, no? but at least the principle is there. Okay? Let's keep their diseases exotic to us, of course. And next, we have uh, innovative ethno-veterinary practices in the control of Newcastle disease and helminthosis in poultry in South Western Uganda. So this would be a good guide for our poultry practitioners who would want to revert into ethno-veterinary medicine as an alternative to using antibiotics in the farm setting. Next, we go to the identification, collection, and preparation of medicinal plants. Of course, it would be good for you to do your prior research at least knowing the plant type and then the parts of the plant that you would need to collect to conserve or not to prevent wasting your time, energy, and resources, okay? It would be nice to do your collection easily and fast so that you would go back to your 
facility as soon as possible and unscathed. Okay. First on the plant part, plant types, we have the tree, the woody tree, the shrub, the vine, and then the grass. Okay. And on the plant parts, it would be good to nice if you need to collect either the leaves, flowers, the fruits, bark or stem, or the root. Prior uh, research should be done to know which of these plant parts would have the highest level of active ingredients that you are interested with so that you only collect those parts and uh, not having to collect all parts of the plant or collecting as much plants but not only needing a few so it's important for us to only get what we need to guide us as when to collect and how to properly collect our samples okay we have to uh, identify which plant part we need prior going to the area and um, usually uh, we are interested on the early stages of growth okay and that will be discussed more in the following slide when it comes to the season of harvest especially if we are interested with a plant that can have several ratoons before we have to replant uh, usually the soil enrichment is done before or as part of the land preparation and sometimes also during the growing stage so we can expect that the nutrients would be higher and then the active ingredients would be higher on the first or early stages of the harvest as compared to the latter ones, okay? When the nutrients and possibly the active ingredients are also nearly depleted. The fourth factor would be on the method of handling during collection. Of course, we have to be organized on this so that we would not be wasting any of our collected samples we have to use our proper collecting paraphernalia. We have our scissors, our sharp scissors, okay? We have our tweezers, our trimmers, so that we do not destroy our samples and we do not destroy or mutilate the remaining part of the plant where we got our samples. The fifth one would be on the physical collection of the collection place. Ideally, um, it should be dry, okay? That's, that's something that uh, we can actually um, control okay especially if uh, we have an option or we can collect as when it's not raining okay ideally we also collect of course when there's no typhoon and when it's not uh, in the rainy season if if that's possible and the second thing is to ensure that our collection area is clean as well so that we do not have um, contaminated samples or at least uh, we do not destroy our samples you know during transit or during uh, any step of our process and lastly would be the storage which is uh, related to number five on the collection process and on the collection place what's important is to have our storage clean and dry because an excess moisture would uh, lead to early spoilage over of our sample furthermore we have uh, other guidelines here that when we collect leaves and stems it's better to do it during daytime when the plant is about to bloom and it is uh, the best time to do this is when it is at dawn okay for reasons that it would uh, be refreshing for the collector to do the sampling so it's not too hot for him he will not be suffering from heat stroke and it is at this time that's related to number two that the flower buds are still closed and that's the better stage of growth of the flowering plants or aromatic plants for us to collect them okay when they have not fully bloomed yet so we can expect that when the sun is already up, they have already opened up and um, that is not the best okay, sample to get. And on the third one, not unless stated, fruits should be collected as when they are ripe. Okay, It's easier to collect the pulp or like the, um, the skin or remove the skin when it's ripe, it's softer. And in relation to that, we have the seeds, okay? Seeds are usually collected when from thoroughly ripened fruits. 
if we have these mature seeds coming from these ripened fruits, we can expect that uh, the extraction process will be more successful as the level of active ingredients on these mature seeds would be higher and then the extraction process would be easier. Number two, barks should be collected when the plants are in bloom or in vigorous growth. So they should be collected from chunks and branches. So this goes to our woody trees. We cannot expect woody trees to have the mature barks that we need if they are not mature enough. Okay, they have to be older. Okay, they have to be older to be able to produce these barks. And these barks should be mature so that we can have this high level of active ingredients that we can easily extract. And lastly, we have the roots and other underground parts are best collected when the plant is in full growth. So we have two reasons for that. The first one is uh, if we have this mature root system, then we can expect a high level of active ingredients coming from them. And the second one is if we have to retain some parts, okay, some root system of our plant, of our plant in that we are taking interest with, the remaining plant can still live on. It can still strive, okay? So those are your two reasons for having to collect from mature root system. Now we will be discussing on the different steps of the processing after we have collected our samples. Okay, we have our guidelines here in our yellow sticky note to only collect what we need. The next step after collecting our samples is to be able to sort them and clean them. Okay, while on site, okay, on the collection site, we have to label them right away so that there would be no confusion, especially if you are still a novice researcher who might get confused on physically similar plants. Okay, the worst scenario would be if this physically similar plants would have opposing effects or purposes and you were able to mix them up, they will just neutralize themselves. So you have wasted, again, your time, money, okay, efforts, resources. If this had happened, okay. Secondly, okay, we have to ensure that they are void of physical debris. Um, if it's possible to clean them up right there, if you have access to clean and running water, so that you can have that in place, dry them up, and in transit to your facility. The next step would be to process them. Okay, it's important to process them either to cut, to trim, to grind, or to chop, uh, so that um, the next steps would be more conducive, such as when you have to dry them up. Uh, more surface area would then be exposed because of the smaller particle size and the drying process would be would be done faster and would be more efficient. Up to the end stage of our processing flow chart, we go to the final storage of our products and it would be good, you know, with this smaller particle size. Uh, it will be better or easier to then store in uh, smaller containers and easier for them for the transport, okay, to wherever they need to go. Discussing further on each step, we have our sorting and cleaning after removal of the physical debris and with access with clean running water, we have to subject them into more rigorous cleaning. Ideally, we do not use samples with pesticides, but if we do not have any choice, then we just subject them to more rounds of cleaning, okay? Second would be on the processing per se, we have two steps. The end result of the first step would still be coarse or a little bit larger particle size of our samples. So then we have to subject them to the second step, which would lead us or give us to a more powderized or pulverized form of our samples. 
So they are now like tinier, tinier particle size. The purposes or the reasons for doing this processing would be these five items. The first is interrelated to number two and then number four. So because we have uh, cut them, we ground them, we pound them, they are now a um, small particle size. Uh, it's then having more exposed surface area to subject them to whatever process, okay? For it, let it be for extraction, uh, boiling water, for example, to be able to extract the active ingredients. So higher level of or higher extraction rate, we can have more or higher level or higher amount of active ingredients that will make our herbal plant more effective. And um, if we have to dry them, so the more surface area now are exposed to the drying element, be it air drying or oven drying, then we it makes the whole drying process more efficient and faster. Okay. Number three, that's a little bit different to reduce the toxicity or adverse effects of certain drugs. So let's say, for example, we're dealing with cassava. We cannot feed cassava fresh or as it is because of possible cyanide toxicity, both in humans and then in animals. So what we need to do is to process it first. So in the, my previous workplace, we need not peel the cassava, but we have to, of course, wash it out of the soil our physical debris, and then we have to cut and we have to dry. So it's actually the aeration process, the drying process that reduces the cyanide content of the fresh cassava. As when the moisture level is down to at least 10%, then uh, it ensures us of a longer shelf life of this product. Um, does it necessarily have to be that low of moisture content to be able to feed? but it's really more on the longevity of the product. But for easy processing, we aerate them, okay? For humans, we fry them up. So that's, uh, aeration is also involved. So the amount of the cyanide in the fresh cassava is reduced to 50%. So then it becomes uh, consumable for us and for our animals. On the fifth, Purpose, we have to make the plant material more convenient to store. Of course, if we now have them in a smaller particle size, especially when they're already dry, uh, we can put them in several small containers, which would be easier for us to transport them okay, to wherever they need to be. For example, as compared to having a, a, a big banana leaf, okay, uncut, okay, preserved intact, it will be difficult to put it inside our backpack if we need to travel to another place, okay? If we cut them up and put them in these individual containers, we can easily put them in our backpack. So it's more convenient to transport them if we have processed them, okay? Going further on the next step in our flowchart, we have the drying process. So I have mentioned this early, early, earlier we have the air drying and then the oven drying the air drying let's say it's the best because it has a low cost no it's cheapest it's, it can be easily done uh, the important factor to consider is if you are in the rainy season it might be a challenge for you to do air drying because of the environmental moisture level okay you can experience uh, easy spoilage or faster spoilage if you try to air dry and then the drying process has not been very, very successful or the moisture content has not been down to the bare minimum of at least 10%, okay? Now, if you are in that situation, you may opt to do oven drying instead. Uh, this is also good, but of course, there's a cost to it. You have to pay or have the oven dryer fabricated to be able to do this. And you can... Uh, dry up several batches of your samples at the same time. Uh, one factor to consider also when doing oven drying is not to overcook them. So you have to monitor your temperometer uh, regularly so that uh, you will not have overheating oven 
that would kill the active ingredients in your sample. The last part would be on the storage. We have three types of storage. The most uh, widely being done is the dry storage. For this to happen, of course, you have to have your sample dried up first, okay? And the two factors you also have to put in place would be having to use clean and dry containers, okay? Aseptic containers. And your storage area should also be clean and dry. So it's putting your moisture level to a bare minimum of 10%. And you have to label your um, your containers, your dry containers, okay, with at least two information. The first one would be the name of your sample. So that could either be the name itself, the scientific name, or if you are using a code. And the second information would be on the date of processing or date of storage, okay? Especially if you are practicing the all-in, all-out method or protocol so it's very important for you to put in your date of processing or date of storage if done properly this dry stored material can last up to several years the second type of storage is the fresh storage your sample can either be fresh or dry and uh, the thing to do with the fresh storage is to use of a uh, non-commercial okay uh preservative we can use uh honey for this okay uh, the thing with using honey is not necessarily drowning your sample with lots of honey but at least ensuring that all parts of your sample is well coated with honey to preserve it okay uh, honey also has high antibacterial properties antifungal properties so it arrests this type of growth okay so that's good in uh, making your sample longer but at most you can only have this for uh, at least six months okay not really also several years as it, when you do dry storage the third type of storage is the liquid storage we have further categories for this first we have the decoction or the water extracts where you have to have your extract first in the liquid form and then you put in your liquid preservative in the form of castor oil, okay? And this can last up to three months. The second one is your alcoholic extracts or your tinctures. And this is quite famous now because several of the households would uh, do aromatherapy, you know? Um, they would use uh, aromatic essential oils okay to aerate okay and purify the household environment we have this aromatherapy quite a lot very very famous and these alcoholic tinctures are very concentrated and they're fragile they should not be in direct sunlight that's why you have them in amber bottles okay, as you can see in our slide and they can last up to six months okay at least six months now we go to our examples of medicinal plants. First, we have makabuhay. So the thing with makabuhay, we use more of the bark than the leaves. And this is quite famous being used for sore eyes, okay, sore eye drops, and also for toothache. And aside from that, we can use this to alleviate fever, inappetence, and also being used as a urine laxative. The second, okay, in our list is iba or calamias. We know from the fruit itself that it is very high in vitamin C. That's why the indications for this plant includes cough with phlegm, ulcers, and constipation. The third plant is the snake grass. This is actually not endemic here in the Philippines. This is widely available in Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, and China. You may see this now because uh, some are already importing the snake plant and you may see them in plant shows. That's why even if not endemic, you may already see them or it's now available here in the Philippines. Uh, the snake plant, okay, the snake grass is uh, being used for, where else? For snake bites, okay? And also for some simple viral 
infections such as the herpes simplex virus lesions and we also have skin rashes and dysentery. The fourth plant is the Grenada or pomegranate, which is uh, very commonly found uh, as an extract being included in our beauty products. We have the shampoos and then the soaps. So the, the tree itself is not common here in South Luzon, but we see several of these in North Luzon and then in Mindanao. The rind or the, the pulp is rich uh, in antimicrobial properties. And the skin, the fruit skin can inhibit uh, growth of the typhoid bacillus and herpes simplex virus. We can also use the, the root as a purgative. Next, we have the Surinam cherry. So this is not located or present here in the Philippines. It is found in Surinam. Um, we can use the, the, the leaves for mouth sores, let's say for ORF, okay, or for uh, foot and mouth disease. But fortunately, we do not have FMD here in the Philippines anymore. Next, we have guava. So guava is the most famous herbal plant. I'm also using this. We have several indications for this. And commonly, we can use this for diarrhea and also for treatment of metritis, vaginitis, okay? This has high antibacterial properties, okay? And they, it also has antiviral properties. Other than that, it can increase platelets and can be used for gastric ulcers, colds, and thrush, okay? Next is the castor oil plant, okay? The castor leaves, when you uh, eat them, they're very bitter, so the palliability or the acceptance of the animals is quite low. So it's challenging to give this to, an, to animals because of its bitter taste, but it's being used as an antihemintic and can be also used for fresh wounds, you know, the topical application for our skin injuries and also for flatulence or diarrhea. Next, we have Candy Candilaan or Blue Bourbon. So please be mindful of this plant. You may have this in your property. Um, it would be good not to remove all of them and probably transplant them to a safer place. So if the time comes that when you need such, you have it already in place, okay? You can use Candy Candilaan for genitourinary ailments, also for sore throat, as a blood purifier for our blood parasites, let's say also for malaria and dengue. And then we can also use this for uh, treatment of vaginitis and hepatitis A. The next one is West Indian M or Bay Cedar, which is not found here in the Philippines and is very common in South and Central America, Caribbean and Mexico. Looking at it physically, the leaves looks like the leaves look like blueberry blueberry leaves or yeah blueberry leaves but they are actually not in the same family um we can use these west indian and leaves for uh, gastrointestinal ailments such as flatulence the next is the duhat okay um we can see the dark color of the fruit we can expect that there is high antioxidant levels of this fruit and we can use the other plant parts for gastrointestinal ailments such as diarrhea and abdominal pain. Next, we have malungay uh, with a Latin name, Moringa olifera. And we know that this can really increase the milk production of not only humans, but also our lactating animals. Because of the high vitamin A, we can use this to alleviate night blindness, eye pain, and then jaundice as well. We can also use this for patients suffering or having difficulty in urination and also as a purgative. The next one is Acapulco, which is the most common medicinal plant being used for skin lesions, such as for fungal infections, ringworms, scabies, and um, other type of skin ulcers. So this is commonly available already as an extra um, for 
topical medicines or ointments available for humans and animals. Next one is turmeric, okay? Uh, because of the color orange, we can expect a high amount of beta carotene coming from this crop. And this is being used for typhoid fever, typhoid fever, dysentery, for cleansing of uh, vaginal discharge um, as a sign of either vaginitis or metritis, and also for uh, mucoid stools. Next, we have aloe vera, okay? So another one that uh, we highly see being extracted for our skin products. The leaves, okay, the gel is very high in um, moisturizing dry skin, okay? That's why it's good for burns, ulcers, and uh, um, eczema, okay? So eczema is a very... Uh, high intensity dryness and itchiness or pruritus of the skin. So the aloe vera is very good because of its high moisturizing properties. And this can also be used as an antihelminthic. The next one is God's crown, which is not endemic here in the Philippines. It is one of the common, most common herbal plant in Malaysia and Indonesia. So it's like if um, we have guava here, they have God's crown there. Okay, they widely use this for dysentery and the leaves and the seeds for eczema and hives. So the higher level type of skin lesions, extreme dryness and pruritus of the skin. Next, we have mangosteen. Okay. We see that it also has a dark color, so we can expect a high level of antioxidants coming from this fruit. And mangosteen, uh, it's already widely available as a commercial product. The brand name is MX3. And it's an herbal supplement, and uh, they have already published at least two research papers uh, claiming okay, of some therapeutic effects. Okay, Although when they... Uh, air their advertisement, they still say that uh, they do not claim any therapeutic effects, but they have this publication, so you can search them online. Um, good enough, the right we can use for dysentery and vaginitis, metritis. The leaves we can use for fever. Next to that is noni, okay? Um, during the 1990s, when I was growing up, there had been a big clamor or fad for noni as a cure-all plant. In itself, um, as a plant for respiratory ailments, it is indeed very good or effective, but still questionable up to now on its anti-cancer properties. Okay? We have um, the fruits and the leaves we can also use for... Uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Next, we have Gale of the Wind or the Stone Breaker. This is something uh, that we can also uh, we can also be trampling or ignoring in our property. But uh, in fact, it has medicinal properties. It can be used as an antihelminthic, as a urine laxative and also as um, a purifier for our hepatitis and malaria patients. Next, we have pandan. So this is just quite simple. We are after the aroma being given the pandan leaves that can increase the inappetence or, you know, alleviate the inappetence. So remove, not increase, no, increase the appetence alleviate the inappetence of our patients. So if they're showing to be a little weak, so the aroma would entice them to eat, okay, entice them to be alert. Next, we have the goto cola, which is uh, known to be an anti-Alzheimer's plant. Okay, we can use the leaves as an anti-tumor, also for hepatitis, ulcers, and fever, okay? Um, during our lecture, so it was Dr. Uh, Eliezer Babylonia who showed us, uh, who shared to us 
that he is eating this goto cola as a fresh salad every day okay he came from a family uh, that has a history of alzheimer's so he's trying to protect himself early as now and taking in this goto cola next we have um serpentina Serpentina is a very potent plant, okay? It can be used for active, uh, acute kidney inflammation, otitis, tuberculosis, okay? Whooping cough, and food poisoning um, with mushroom, cassava, and then seafood. It's actually expensive to buy serpentina powder, okay? To put in uh, your daily supplements. This is an expensive herbal plant, but it's very, very potent. Next, we have sambong. Okay, we now see several preparations of sambong commercially or as an extract, you know, to these uh, syrups. And the indications for taking in sambong would be if you have um, influenza, if you're diarrheic, okay, and um, even for genitourinary genital ailments. Next to that is flaxweed. Okay, this is something that you may also see in your property that you may ignore it. Okay, but now please do try to preserve it because it has some medicinal properties. Commonly, we use the leaves as a topical uh, preparation for our eczema and venomous insect things and thrush next we have the betel or nganga we have two types the common betel or the red betel uh, we use the leaves for um, eye pain eczema itchy skin bleeding gums and nosebleeds uh, we can expect higher antioxidant levels for coming from the red betel because it is darker in color and so we can use it further for uh, inflammation of the internal organs, such as if we have pneumonia, we have cystitis, hepatitis, and gastritis. Next, we have the sarsap. So we call this guyabano or guyabano. And we can use uh, the leaves and the stems for genitourinary ailments, such as bladder pain, gastrointestinal ulcers, and pain. Okay? Next, we have Dila Dila, which is something that you can also see in your property. So please do not try to remove them all because you can use them for influenza, fever, eye inflammation, diarrhea, a snake bites, jaundice, and uh, cystitis. Okay. Third to the last, okay, we have wild ginger. And it is uh, more orange in color. It has a higher level of beta carotene than the common ginger. And it can inhibit osteoarthritis. It can be used for hepatitis, cystitis, flatulence, inappetence, okay? And it can also help slightly increase the milk production. Second to the last, we have broad leaf plantain or lantain, which is not easily found here in Batangas, but you can see more of this in the Quezon province. You can use this lantain or something that you may also think as a weed in your property. Okay, you can use it for muscle pain, for diarrhea, genitourinary disorders, cough, and inflammation. Lastly, we have sodia, which is a shrub mosquito repellent, okay? We can use the bark for um, malaria fever reliever and the leaf, other than being a repellent, we can use it for headache, fever, abdominal pain, and injuries. Next, we go to the different ways on how to measure, okay, your samples. Uh, now we can have uh, good access with our 
different measuring paraphernalia, especially now we have several digital weighing scales, big scales, kitchen scales, okay? But if you are um, in an area without access to such tools, and if um, they don't have access to such tools and you're teaching them, okay, you can start with this one. Um, aside from that, we in the farm setting, most of the farm staff would usually measure with their hands, okay? Either they do not have set access to the measuring cup or they just don't want to use the measuring cup, okay? So we have um, a good remedy to that. So we use the palm. And if we put in a small sample size here at the middle of our palm, that is more so equivalent to five grams. And then if we put a higher hip, that's 10 grams, but still in the middle of our palm, if it reaches to the middle of our fingers, that's 25 grams, and up to the tip of our fingers, that's, that's 50 grams. For the liquid component of this one, I have been using this measurement quite often already, especially when I'm doing extension work. Um, one teaspoon is equivalent to five mils if you are measuring liquids and five grams for our solid samples. And one tablespoon is equivalent to 15 mils and that's three teaspoon. And of course, we have for two tablespoons, that's 30 mils. Commonly in the countryside, the size of the cups available would be the low ones. And that is equivalent to approximately one fourth liter. And then our two small cups would be approximately equivalent to one pint and so forth. For the drinking glass, we have the small type, almost equivalent to 237 mils. So I remember growing up, there was this brand of uh, peanut butter that would have their container as glass, drinking glasses with different designs. So what we would do is to recycle these drinking glasses and make them as part of our a set of drinking glasses. So at least uh, you were still able to reuse and uh, this or uh, give a longer life okay, for these glass containers. And that's uh, about 237 mils. One ounce or eight ounces of eight ounces of a Coke bottle is approximately also equivalent to 237 mils. Okay. Previously, we do not have bigger containers for our soda. The best that we have before was one liter. Now we have 1.5 and two liters. For a limited time, um, the soda companies also released a 750 mils, okay, glass container. So that's what we have for our FAO publication. The 375 mils would be more so your ketchup bottle and your 320 mils would be more so your mayonnaise bottle. Now we go to a game. This is a guessing game. And I'm showing you an illustration of how to process this end product. And what you're going to do is to guess what the end product is. Okay, what? What's the term or what do you call the end product coming out of this process being shown to you? So let me describe it. We have um, a pot with water and we have an active fire. And now uh, having this for a certain time, the water is now boiling. After such, we sieve the boiled water into a filter or cheesecloth. We let it cool and then we use to our patient. So what do you think is the name of this end product? Okay, I hope your answer is correct. Yeah, the, the name is decoction. So the, the secret or the difference of decoction to another similar product is the active fire. Okay, you have to 
boil the water first. Okay, that's uh, one of the good tips. Boil the water first. Put in your sample. Subject it for 15 to 60 minutes active fire. Do not put the cover in. So it should be like aerating. And after 15 to 20 minutes, okay, you can uh, remove the sample and boil it again. So you can have two batches and you can expect higher active ingredients, higher level of the active ingredients on the second extraction rather than on the first. But still, I use the first. And actually, even after the second extraction, what's ever left on the sample, I still try to use it, um, especially if I'm making a madre de cacao decoction for mange patients. So I still scrub the, the leaves on the patient before really trying to put them away, OK? Now, this is the second end product. As opposed to the first, with this one, we boil, we, we boil the water first and then we dip, okay? We put in the boiling water. So now the sample is being soaked, okay? For a certain number of minutes. After such, we sieve again with a cheesecloth and pull it down before giving it or applying it to our patient. So what do you think is the name of this end product? Okay, let's see. It's infusion. Okay, the practical application for such, maybe you're doing this previously every day with your instant noodles. So they're being soaked for a certain number of minutes. For hot infusion, that's the same time as decoction, 15 to 20 minutes. So you have two types of infusion, the hot and then the cold. For the cold, it would take up to 24 hours before you can expect like more active ingredients coming out of your sample into your infusion. But as we know, the hot infusion is more efficient because it takes lesser time. And even with that short time, maybe we already have a lot more active ingredients extracted as compared to the cold infusion after 24 hours. Okay, this is the third end product. What do you think is the name? If there's pounding, grinding involved, and there's sieving with a, um, a colander or a sieve, a filter. Okay, let's see. The end product is what you call the powder, okay? Uh, we have to dry the sample first. It would not be good to try to process, you know, cut, grind, and pound fresh sample because um, of the moisture content, they will try to clump up together. Uh, what we need for a powder is for them to be loose, okay? So it has to be dry. They should not be clumping up. You have to either air dry or open dry your sample first before you do this fine uh, grinding or pounding so you have good quality powder. Okay, next. So we have uh, the same initial step, which is pounding and grinding. And the latter step is different this time. So we try to squeeze in with the use of a cheesecloth. Okay, I think. The end product is quite easy to guess. It is called the juice. For this type of end product, of course, we have to have fresh samples. If dry, so at whatever time you know, or strength you put in squeezing, you will not be able to get any juice if your sample is dry. So this has to be fresh. So commonly, we use this uh, process in making turmeric juice. So we try to shred, okay, turmeric, and then we put it in a cheesecloth, and then we squeeze it, the juice out. So for the turmeric, we have to wear gloves because the, the orange color is very rich. It will stain your nails. Next one, it involves oil. 
mixing, pounding, grinding, and then mixing with oil. What do you think is the end product? Let's see. It's a poultice or paste, okay? This is one of the most notable skin preparation that we do. Um, of course, with one of the examples I have given earlier, we have the Acapulco paste, okay? You have to use dry sample as much as possible to mix with your carrier, okay? So that could either be oil, water, molasses, honey. Okay, um, in my experience, it would be better to use oil, okay? Oil instead of water. So with water, it would dry up. And then if you put in, like if you make balls, um, it will disintegrate, okay? If the water has already dried up. For usually for skin uh, ointments, it's better to use the oil. Okay, they do not, the oil will not dry up over time. Uh, you may use honey for paste because it has high antibacterial properties. It has some antifungal and antiviral properties as well. So you're um, having two purposes, you know, in trying to treat your skin or like open wound, okay? Um, the honey will also act on the skin wound together with your active ingredient, okay? So it's dual purpose. I would not recommend to use molasses, okay, because it's very, very sticky. So just um, revert to honey. It's just that honey is, of course, expensive as compared to molasses. Next one. What do you think is the name of this end product? So it's like you're baking, you're molding it into circular or oval shapes with the use of honey, okay? Would you guess? Would you say these are what you call cookies? <laughs> Usually the shape is actually oval or uh, circular. But uh, up to you, you can actually use a heart, you can use a star, or any, any shape that fancies you, okay? Commonly, we call this end product the bolus. Ideally, it's better to use dry samples, okay? Same reason as what I have mentioned earlier. It's the um, easier to have, um, to form, easier to form, the the balls if they are dry and then especially if you put in honey so honey is more sticky or stickier than molasses molasses has higher moisture content so sometimes over time your bolus would disintegrate if you just use molasses um it's just that honey is more expensive okay now we Go to the last part, which would be on the various applications of our finished products. First, we have drenching, which is the application of liquid preparation into the mouth. So we can use several uh, tools, okay? For the piglets, we can use the syringe. For the growers, we can reuse the clean uh, semen bottle being used for AI for pigs. And then for the more mature ones, either we use um, clean, empty bottles, okay? And the restraint could either be um, through force or with the use of um, a rope, you know, to restrain the snout. So I prefer uh, giving these trenches when the animal is upright, okay? And not restrained and down on the ground because... Um, it will be more difficult for them to swallow the drench. Secondly, we can force feed them on our solid end products, solid herbal uh, preparation, herbal drugs, okay? So this is a bolus being given to a hen, okay? Next, we have topical application. Furthermore, we have three types of uh, Topical preparations, we have the poultice or the paste, 
we have fermentation and compress. The difference between the second and the third, the second or the fermentation is moist. Okay, so it's partly soaked, it's wet, and then you try to transfer the, the heat, okay, to the body of the patient. For the compress, it's dry. So you're only, you only use the water vapor to make the towel hot, and then you transfer the heat to the body of the patient. So that's compress. Next, we have nasal application, although not widely being practiced, and it's actually difficult to do this, especially for large ruminants, okay? They would find the cloth over their head quite irritating. So for humans, this is easily done. And uh, here now, as we are in the COVID-19 pandemic, I have heard of several folks doing this nasal application so trying to inhale the what the vapor the hot vapor coming from decoctions of uh, the mentioned medicinal plants with uh, properties good for alleviating respiratory ailments okay next we have vaginal application we call this preparation as spessary okay so that's the specific term. The way to prepare it's like preparing for a bolus. So you put it in a cylindrical shape with the use of your dry sample and then your honey or your molasses or your mineral oil. For a pessary, ideally, it's good to use mineral oil instead instead of the molasses and then the, the, the honey, okay? To be able to put it in, you have to have your clean hands and your uh, nails should be properly cut, okay? So it will not cause any trauma inside the reproductive tract of the animal. You have to properly lubricate your hand so it will be easy to insert it in the reproductive tract. And you have your pessary in your palm here, so it's like in a cup, okay? You're cupping as you go inside and then you leave the pessary there. It will be absorbed in three days by the reproductive tract. So then it will now elicit its action to ideally, you know, treat your, the ailment of the patient. The next is if you are to infuse a liquid, you know, also in the reproductive tract, so you can use a decoction, a guava decoction for metritis. Okay, that one I'm highly using. We can use, uh, we can reuse a clean AI catheter or uterine catheter. And then we can put in our cool down decoction in the re clean reused semen bottle. Okay, if you do not have access on this type of paraphernalia, we can use papaya uh stock okay papaya stock just on the uh the narrower side of the papaya stock we have to ensure that it's not sharp okay the edge would not be sharp so it will not cause trauma on the reproductive tract of the animal and then we infuse the decoction through the papaya stock we have to put in enough lubrication so it will be easy to insert the stock Next, we have anal application. So if we have pessary for vaginal application, we call the anal application or the anal bolus as suppository, okay? So the application is the same as when you do the vaginal application. So you have to put in enough lubrication as well. So it's easy to insert your hand. Next, we have ocular uh, application uh, with the makabuhay decoction, right? or decoction of uh, malunggay, okay? So we can use indigenous materials such as the sorghum straw we or the rice straw, okay? The more commercial paraphernalia would be the use of a dropper, a plastic one, or the glass type, okay? Next, we have fumigation. So this is actually the last application, which is not encouraged here in the Philippines anymore because of the DENR Clean Air Act. Okay, but um, we, as we know, in the far flung areas, okay, they, they may still do this because this is highly effective actually in warding off insects. Okay, 
So we uh, use, we use, we try to burn leaves of um, insect repellent trees. Okay, we have our neem, we have our eucalyptus, we have our citronella. Okay, we try to burn the leaves and then we cover it with a banana leaf. And then the smoke, okay, considering the wind direction, will go to where the animals are housed, okay? Um, if um, you are housing animals that are not sensitive to smoke, okay, such as goats and then poultry, it's okay that the animals are in, inside, okay? So, or if you have the option, it's better for you to fumigate when they are grazing outside or they are ranging outside. That's when you fumigate. And then stop as when they are about to go home to their enclosures, okay? Just a few more pictures on uh, the different uh, administration in poultry. Either we also use like forced drenching or drenching and then we give in supplements in their water and we spray them or cacawater decoction to remove of external parasites and also we use the leaves of cacawate to um, prevent uh, the external parasites like aphids and then uh, the nicknick no to infest the nesting area of poultry or where they lay their eggs no so we have to put this insect repellent leaves or 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 shrubs okay to prevent any infestation of these external parasites okay finally of course i would like to thank itcph who has trained me on ethno veterinary medicine since 2018 and i have also taken some of the notes from and photos coming from Dr. Eliezer and Babylonia. Thank you very much.